So finally, I am going to start reading the Six of Crows duology by Lee Bardugo. It's about to be a ceremony right now. We about to open this up. So black spray painted edges. The first in the Six of Crows duology, I am excited to start reading it. And we got Creek Kingdoms with the red painted edges. I will say that the casing for this is it's not as thick and prestigious as the one for the Hunger Games trilogy. They had like a little bit more thickness to the casing. Mm -hmm. I mean, she I, she could do it. She's easily battered and bruised and disintegrating. But for now, Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo. Progress Report 1 on Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo. Action. I am 142 pages into Six of Crows. Since I've started it, I've been really engaged in the story. It's just been drama and action from the beginning. The story, it just unfolds where you're getting a lot of information. You're getting to connect with the characters and you're just getting invested in this story. I can't help but compare Six of Crows to the Grisha Trilogy because with the Grisha Trilogy, we were stuck in Alina's head. We were just stuck in that first person perspective. And I feel like that cut off our connection to other characters. And then because we we're spending so much time with Alina, we got to experience so much of how annoying Alina came across. She just felt utterly unlikable consistently. So this story, you're able to like connect with characters from like this third person limited perspective. I'm connecting with characters whether I like them or I don't like them or whatever. I'm really getting to understand who they are. Prior to going into the Grisha Trilogy, a lot of people that read both series, they were like, the Grisha Trilogy is good for like really getting an understanding of the world building. Dare I say, Six of Crows is just a better story and I feel like it's better world building. This just expands the world more. It just feels like more, not even just because we're like in a whole different city. I understand people's powers a lot better. I'm 142 pages in. We just had like a big piece of action that I'm just kind of like, yo, oh my gosh, like, oh, it's, uh, she's about to get like exciting, explosive, va va boom, honey. So far, I don't really think I have a favorite character. I think maybe Jesper a little bit might be my favorite character, but I won't lie. I honestly probably like him the most because he's coded and kind of reads as black from the description, but then also from the Shadow and Bone casting, he's like the only black character. So like, he just feels, I don't know, he just feels relatable because he's black, but that's not enough of a reason. But I do like Jesper's personality. There's still like a fun loving, cool, interesting side to him that I like. And he's really skilled at what he does like so it's not just because he's black actually I do enjoy Inez a lot because she's so cool and she's so quiet she's just chill and she does her fucking job see I like Inej I like Inej I do think I like Inej and I like ja Jasper Jasper because black it is what it is Inej because other person of color but also like you know what I'm minding my business I'm doing my job and I'm chilling, like, what the fuck? I think I like Jesper and Inej because they're both very skilled at what they do. And they're very, like, sure and confident in that. I know my business. What's up? You know what I'm saying? Y'all not gonna catch me half-stepping. So far, I have one quote that I really liked. Some dialogue with Nina that I was just like, she trying to say something without saying something. You know what I'm saying? So basically, Nina and Matthias have a sordid history, some kind of history that we don't know about yet. Matthias is very conservative and Nina's a little bit more liberal. This scene really hit for me. Matthias says, a good time needn't involve wine and flesh. And Nina batted her glossy lashes at him. You wouldn't know a good time if it sizzled up to you and stuck a lollipop in your mouth. With just that line, the thing that it made me think about was, I'm. I'm kind of convinced that Nina was pegging Matthias. And he, you know, being the conservative person that he is, was just like, oh my gosh, this bitch, she got me fucking like out of my character. I wouldn't be pegged. That's just immoral, blah, 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 blah. But Matthias know he liked that shit. 
The only thing is he's just mad that he opened up his heart and he got vulnerable with her and she betrayed him. And now he's like, mm -hmm. yo, I let this bitch peg me and now I feel defiled. So now I feel like super betrayed and hyper masculine and annoyed. Like I had this bitch pegging me, man. I mean, I love this shit, but also at the same time, like, nah, I shouldn't have done that shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? I just loved it. Cause the whole lollipop thing, it felt like it was innuendo. It was like, I had that strap in your face. Your mouth was on the strap, so don't act like. <laughs> and maybe he was a little apprehensive at the beginning, but you know he liked that shit, Nina. You know he liked that shit. You know he was like. <laughs> you know he was like, yippee ki -yay on that pad, girl. Like, you know what's up, Nina, girl. She, she just trying to help him save face, you know, by saying he don't know what a good time. But she know he know a good time. Another thing I noticed is the exchange between Jasper and Wylan. That's giving me a little bit of enemies to friends to lovers or something. They might just be enemies to friends, but, you know, I'm here for a little romance. So I wouldn't mind seeing Jesper and Wyland having class dynamics involved where Jesper kind of comes from the streets, he comes from gangs, which some of that's coded a little weird because he's like the black person in a gang with guns and he's hooking up with this white boy from a rich family. It's, it's giving, it's giving a little problematic. It's giving a little, did we have to code the black person as a gang member with guns? I wouldn't mind if they like, you know, got a little romantic, but they might just end up being friends, like enemies to friends. It is what it is. But I'm also like, looking at the coding of those things. I'm also noticing how characters are described. Translating this fantasy world to our world, Inej to me is a South Asian character. From the casting, you get who it is, but also just in reading the story. Somebody like Matthias, although he's feared in and he's white and he's, from my understanding, he's like blonde, blue eyes. But for lack of the better terminology, he comes across more like he's Afghani or Saudi Arabian or like from just his religious beliefs. It's a lot more conservative in that way. And Jesper basically sounds like he is from an African country but lives in England. And that's another thing, Ketterdam to me seems kind of like it's based on England. And I'm guessing Novi Zem is supposed to be like, is it supposed to be like Africa? Is it supposed to be like America? I think it's supposed to be like America, but I keep thinking of it also as New York. Maybe it's a combination of New York and America at the same time, but also possibly Canada, I'm not sure. And then we already kind of know that Ravka is kind of like Russia, or at least like Eastern European countries, like just a conglomeration with Russia's culture being like the dominant idea that's behind what Ravka is about. And then the Shuhan is like Asian countries. And Firda is like, I guess, North Asian countries. And where's Zemini? I haven't seen Zemini on the map. But now I'm starting to think that maybe Zemini is not necessarily African. It might actually be America. I would love to have a translation of the Grishaverse world building to our world building. But so far I'm loving it. I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. I'm at chapter 25, page 301. I am getting so endeared to the characters. I'm in, like connecting to the characters. I'm like, I'm getting so much. Why people love this book so much. Why people have talked about it so much. Reading this, I'm just like, yo, the potential for what the Grisha trilogy could have been is fulfilled in Six of Crows. In reading this, I come to the realization that the Grisha trilogy should have actually been told in third person like this is being told and just from different perspectives. Because at the end of the day, reading only from Alina's perspective, she's basically very much in the Bella Swan lane of character. I gotta reread Twilight. I really gotta reread it and see how I feel about it now. Alina fits in that lane, in that trope of just those girls that you're supposed to like insert yourself in, but you're also like in their heads. So it's not really you, it's like them, but it's also like you're inserted into... And it's just like, it doesn't work because they're balancing having a personality with not having one. It's a conflict of interest. It really should have been told from more perspectives. Maybe if I'd gotten more of Mal's perspective, like being able to like be in his head, I would have had a different perspective of him. Because I feel like Alina's eyes, she colored a lot of things not in the best light. Because she's so annoying, so many other things were annoying around her. Surprisingly, Nikolai wasn't, and it's like, 
like his characterization could go there. And he was just more likable, more interesting, just more captivating. His personality just got beyond the issues with Alina. Okay, this is not about the Christian trilogy. I say all that to say at the end of the day, it's Christian trilogy should have been written in third person and from more perspectives. We would have gotten better character development. Dare I say better world building? The world building in this just feels so much more natural. You got to live in it. And you get so much more expansion on the world in this. I just figured out what Novi Zem is, which I'm pretty sure... The Novi Zem is supposed to be like New York, but it's not really New York because Novi Zem is basically America. And Ketterdam, from my understanding, is supposed to be London or just England and possibly Amsterdam as well, not sure. But also, I've come to the realization that Fjorda is basically Scandinavian countries, but also Germany. But Germany in World War II times. Although I also feel like Fjorda is also North Asian countries and Ravka is basically like Russia and probably the entire Eastern Bloc. I'm just curious about where Africa is in all of this. I'm curious about which country or which area of the map represents Africa, but I'm not sure. So I'm gonna let that go. I guess it's Kenst here. It does look like there's a little bit of African shape there, but it's small. And I don't like that. Like, girl, no. Like, you're not gonna just world build some Africa and just, how are you gonna make it look? But beyond that, Jasper and Wallen are the G in LGBTQ confirmed. I like read the little subtext and I got it. I was like, mm, this is giving a little enemies to friends to possibly lovers, I don't know. They might be friends, but you know, I'm just like, it's giving more than just friends. And if you don't give me more than friends, you're queer baiting at this point and your cancel says, but I'm, a l I'll, there's also mixed feelings because I'm just looking at it like, ugh. It's somebody of color with a white boy. But also this book was written before we like really starting to like really reckon with somebody of color dating somebody white in a queer relationship. Like that's been overdone. I'm tired of it. I'm really tired of it. But at the same time, I can't expect much more because it's a straight white woman writing these two gay men in a relationship. I can't expect her to be like, I'll make Wylan somebody of color instead of like making him a white guy. It would be nice if she could do that, but that's probably not going to be on top of mine. But they're well written in here and really engaging so far that like, okay, I'm... I'm still enjoying it. I'm still enjoying it despite how I feel. I want to see two people who are of same heritage or same race like being in a relationship with each other, especially two black LGBTQ characters, especially two dark skin LGBTQ characters in a relationship. I would love to read that. Surprisingly enough, I am enjoying and loving Nina and Matthias's like interactions in their relationship. There's the secrets coming out about why they are where they are now in the book. You know, I'm still convinced that Nina pegged Matthias and he's still in his feelings a little bit about that, you know, because he's just like, I didn't need this bitch to peg me, you know, but also I loved it. I was here for it, you know, but he was also still like, this bitch betrayed me. So it's like, mm, mm -mm. nah, I shouldn't have gave you my precious booty hole. But at the same time, I really wanted you to ride this booty hole down, you know what I'm saying? I'm enjoying Nina and Matthias' relationship. I love their interactions, their connections, so much of their backstory. I like Inej and Kaz. I've heard people talk about their connection and how they interact with each other. It's not connecting for me, and I guess it's not connecting for me because they have their own set of walls. Inej has her own set of walls with her religion and her upbringing and her family. And Kaz has his own with secrets and his past and all that stuff. I figure all of that plays a part into the wall that I'm having with the seeing them connecting in a relationship. I just still kind of see them as friends. I am looking forward to getting even further into this book and seeing where we end off. I recently finished Six of Crows. It was just so action-packed coming down to the end. I love Nina's scene where, which, I, ooh, I hate that the Jirda Param is just so... Heroin, it's so crack. 
It's just so fentanyl. It's just so crystalline methamphetamine. It's just so bad. But the fact that it just like gives them like amplified powers and it's just like your powers are super, super now. Like, oh, uh, I wanted to see more of that, but it's just like the side effects are just, it's not worth it. It's not worth it, girl. It's just not worth it. Don't do it. But I just love that scene. Dare I say Nina's becoming my bitch? And she was just all baddie. She was like, swipe, swipe, you bitches are down. What's up? Like, it's over for you hoes. And I was just like, this is a really good book. Like, she did her thing. Like, I don't know, maybe people critiqued the trilogy, the Grisha trilogy, and were like, girl, <laughs> you, you... Uh, you almost had it, girl. You almost had it. Or maybe she just really wanted to write this. She was, like, really excited about this. She put her whole fucking foot, her ass, everything in this bitch. And then the trilogy, she was kind of like, I'm not completely there with this yet. I'm almost there. But, like, we got to put this trilogy out because that's what the publishers want. But honestly, this book feels like... It just came from a place of great creative passion and love and like I really wanted to write about this world and I really wanted to write this story so I wrote this. And like I really knew what I wanted to keep, I really knew what I wanted to get rid of to really make the story pop. I honestly see myself rereading this. I enjoyed this so much. And now I am currently reading Crooked Kingdom. I am 55 pages in. I'm enthralled by this even more. Now reading this book, I find that Kaz is a lot more cutthroat and ruthless. And I was kind of like, did I miss that in the first book? And the thing that changed from this book to this one, Inej is not there anymore. She's not a part of his life anymore. So here's the thesis. The reason why he's so like unhinged and ready to like crush the skulls of babies at this point, which is like, girl, what the fuck? He really wants to save Inej, but I also feel like Inej is somebody that kind of keeps him in control, keeps him in check, which that in itself is kind of problematic. A woman shouldn't be like having to be there to keep a man in check, to keep him like from doing ridiculous, horrible, violent things. Like he should be able to have that within himself that he could hold his ground and say I take responsibility for my actions I'm not going to do these bad things because I have empathy and humanity and I care about people like I'm I don't need this woman to balance me out according to Ross Matthews on his podcast you shouldn't be two 50% people coming to meet each other at the 50% line to be like 100%. Like, you should both be 100% meeting each other at the 50-yard line. That's, like, an analogy on that. I get what he's saying. I don't know if you get what I'm saying because I'm secondhand giving you this. But at the end of the day, Kaz needs to hit the therapy for a quick minute because I've been watching a lot of reality TV. A lot of the people that I'm watching, like, on Married at First Sight are like, y'all don't need a relationship. You need therapy. You don't need to be with somebody else. You need therapy first before you can actually say I want to get married to someone and that's what I'm feeling with Kaz like Kaz can't just be like I get it you really love her and I really want him to like be there to save her but it's at the same time it's like you need to be whole I get why he's just so ruthless but it's just the like he really shouldn't be like depending on a woman. He shouldn't be depending on anyone else to like keep in check your dark passenger. You should be able to like keep in check your dark passenger. You need therapy, okay? But we'll see how him being ruthless unfolds. I mean, it's working, it's helping at this point, but at the same time, it's also like, hmm. Mm. You weren't exactly like a hero before. I get your backstory, but at the same time, you were not this ruthless before. Maybe I, I, because I was getting to know him and before, and I came in maybe with a preconceived idea of who he was. To me, he was just a smart mastermind type before, and now he's just like cutthroat. On the world building, quick note on the world building real quick. I feel like the southern colonies are like the Caribbean, but just reimagined as just like one massive land together. I'm still trying to figure out where Africa is. Maybe I need to read Nikolai's story and like the map will expand more and I'll be like, oh, there goes Africa. The Wandering Isles though is definitely Ireland, I'm pretty sure of. But Africa ain't here right now. I am currently reading in Inej's chapter. I've noticed that about Inej, the more I read is that her chapters almost seem a little bit more poetic. I feel like it's a little too amusing and that doesn't work well with my, I guess, attention span or whatever is going on in my head. Like, it just doesn't work well because I kind of end up rereading a lot of stuff. I kind of fall asleep on it a little bit. It's beautiful writing. It's still just like, 
I'm enjoying hearing from Wyland's perspective now, which I thought was just so interesting that like his perspective was not offered in Six of Crows. But I get why it wasn't because it wasn't that necessary as it is now. Also, I still find it problematic that, you know, Wyland and the gunslinger gangbanger is like together. I'm appreciating the flirtation in their relationship. I kind of like that a little bit. We're on a mission. There's not really going to be too much for them to be like pushing up on each other and saying like, I really like you or whatever. So at this point, it's just very flirting with each other, showing each other a little like, yeah, I'm into it, I'm into you. We're busy, we have things to do. So let's get that done first and then we can like start, we can go out on a date. We could get a drink at the bar type of thing. You know what I'm saying? I'm looking forward to seeing what more adventure we're gonna go into because I don't think the Inej situation is the only thing that we have to deal with. I, I'm sensing more things that are to come. It's just how it's gonna unfold. I might suspect something's coming. I will get that thing coming, but I just don't know exactly how it's gonna come. How is this about to unfold? Just bring it, just bring it. I am now 181 pages into Cricket Kingdom. It's been a lot of action, a lot of just like a lot of like you getting in on the plans and you get really invested in the story. I will say one thing though, I think for a significant portion, at least two parts, we didn't get Kaz's perspective and I kind of was like, oh, that's interesting. It's like we get Wyland's perspective, but we didn't get as much Kaz's perspective. And then I also thought about the fact that like the reason why Kaz almost seemed Seems more ruthless in this book is because we get to see how other people see him from their perspective. They see him as more violent, more ruthless, like really see him as the demon that they say he is. And now I'm in the middle of a cast chapter where we're getting to see him as like, oh, he's not that bad a guy. He's, you know, he's like an anti-hero. But then I also kind of understand that we being ruthless out here because this is a ruthless situation. This is a crooked kingdom. So you gotta get a little crooked with the king. Them. We gotta get down in the trenches and like fight dirty like the rest of them are because we ain't gonna get nowhere if we don't get a little dirty, you know what I'm saying? And it's also the same thing with Van Eck. They made a point where Kaz said, yo, we gotta show the world that Van Eck is just as much a street thug. He's just as much like a vile person as the rest of us, but he's just cleaned up and made to look like he's got it together. But you know, if he was down here, bitch, he would have pulled a knife, he would have pulled a gun, he would have pulled anything and he would have been like, in the trenches ready to fight with everybody else. He don't care, he's ready to draw blood, he don't care, but he's in this upper crust high society, so I'll let the henchmen deal with it. I don't get my hands dirty, but bitch, you would get your hands dirty, don't play. You not even directly getting your hands dirty, but like you're getting your hands dirty from 10 steps behind, because you telling everybody else what to do. So, you, you, you messy, you bad, you disgusting. Another thing about the cash chapters, I was not expecting them to come so soon. Cause we're at 181 pages and I figured like Kaz's chapter, like where we're actually getting his perspective again. I figured that would come at least maybe at the end of the book. But all the same, I'm excited to see how this develops because the whole superhero, super villain, super henchman with the wings and the, the, the metal under their skin thing that I'm like, Bitch, how are we going to have that plus Van Eck? We trying to get our money at the same time. And I'm like, I really want them to get their money at the end. Like, they better get their money at the end. Because I don't need them hustling for the rest of their lives. Because, you know, I feel like I, like, connect with them. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, at the same time, like, I want y'all to win. I want y'all to get y'all money. Y'all deserve. Y'all put in the work. Y'all went to the ice court. Y'all got Kuwait. Y'all sorted that mystery out. Y'all did y'all job. Y'all did what y'all was hired to do. And Vanek was like, nah, I'm gonna just double cross y'all. Well, no, Vanek's about to go down because he was about to take my girl Inej's legs out. Fuck you mean, you're, you're bugging. Somebody gonna need to kick his ass, like, in the stomach. You know what I'm saying? I'm appreciating the Wylan and Jasper relationship. So, you know, when Jasper makes Wylan blush, but I ain't gonna lie to you though. It's a cute moment and he makes him blush. I'll be like, oh. <laughs> Not to say there's anything wrong with interracial relationships, but at the same time, it's also like, I just can't relate. The thing that's bothersome about it too, I think, is that he, as the person of color, Jasper, as the black person, is like the more assertive partner in this relationship. And Wylan is just the more shy, sweet one. 
I feel like it's kind of pushing a kind of narrative, a kind of like stereotype that, you know, like the innocent white boy and then it's like the aggressive black man. For me, because I've seen uh, or I understand these stereotypes, I kind of see like, okay, that's what that's looking like in the lights is. I can't expect much different from Lee Bardugo writing like predominantly main white characters. But at the same time, it's also still like, ugh. Sometimes when it comes up, it'll be like, mm, I feel a little skeeved. Ugh. But it's whatever, you know. I am now 428 pages into the book on chapter 32. It is a Nigerian chapter. I'm about to start reading that. A lot's happened since the last time we spoke. <laughs> Basically, we went on a little trip with Jasper and Wylan, and that was really nice. It like, it kind of endeared me to their relationship a little bit more. Getting a little bit more backstory on both of them, especially Wylan kind of like endeared me to their characters individually, but it also kind of endeared me to their relationship getting together. And then later on, we had some little mess. There was like a mistake with a kiss. That happened, and then when they actually kiss, I got real skeeved out. And it's because it's the dynamics of their relationship. Jesper being the more masculine presented character, the more aggressive of the two, and Wylan being the more submissive, softer one, the one more pursued. And then like in the kiss, there were like delicate bones of his neck. I was just a little skeeved out by that. Mm, I don't like it. After I read The Prophets, and there was the whole thing with the big brute black man and this like white slave owner son and they're like getting it on and the black man as a slave like being submissive to this white man but also being like aggressive and it's just it's, it's i don't mm, it's weird don't really like it so reading it in this book and then the whole delicate bones of wylan and jesper like caressing his face and just i don't know i just don't like it it's giving me race play and i'm not here for race play okay i know that the context is different because of their relationship and it's like it's not our world it's a different world so race isn't really a thing but I also kind of feel like it's been alluded in the book that Jesper being like darker skinned that makes him stand out. They haven't really talked about race as a thing that Jesper gets prosecuted for his skin color but they keep bringing up the fact that his skin stands out which makes him for me seem different within the world. I'm assuming that white people are the majority in this world although they are darker skinned people they are still minority in the amount of people that they are and I guess Yes. Well, I don't know if minority in social hierarchy and social power, but they are minorities from what I'm reading, I'm grasping from the book. It's still just weird for me. I guess the politics or the understanding of race that we have in our world may not necessarily apply in this book. It is coming from a place of being informed by our world through this white woman who is a writer. So I'm still, mm, I'm a clock it. What's the tea with this thing that's happening in the book? Mm, what's that about? But beyond that, I don't know, I'm just, I'm back to being real indifferent, real so-so mm, about it. Like, I don't know, she real mid. I was kind of excited about it happening, but then it's like the more it like played out and unfolded, I was just kind of like, mm, mm. I don't mind an interracial relationship, but also like, I don't know, maybe I'm bringing my own understandings and baggage and my thoughts about the prophets into it, but you know, maybe not. I did think about this relationship in regards to most of the people that would be reading this book. I'm assuming it's gonna be mostly women and it's gonna be mostly white women. And I feel like the setup of Jasper and Wylan in a relationship makes it easier for the predominant audience of young white women to be able to kind of relate or at least kind of insert themselves into Wylan because that kiss came from Wylan's perspective at the time. It just felt very much like Wylan could have been written as a girl. I appreciate that he wasn't. It is a way that kind of makes their gay queer relationship a bit more accessible to a straight white woman audience. Mm. That's just my thought that I thought of. It, it, 
it's just a thought. Mm -hmm. But besides that, I feel like Matthias and Nina's relationship has gotten a lot of growth and we got a went through a lot with them so it's like there haven't been much in regards to their relationship and then it's like we got a little bit more with Kaz and Inej's relationship so it was like a little bit deeper it was cute it was, it's a lot because Kaz is going through trauma still need that therapy hit you up a doctor in Ketterdam what's up you ain't gotta shake their hand when you come in you could just say hi I'm hoping he gets money in the end and I'm hoping once he gets that money he says you know what let me de-stress and hit up a therapist. Unpack your baggage, unpack all your traumas. Either way, I'm just looking forward to seeing what's gonna happen with them in the end. There's a plan in motion. I'm excited about the plan. After reading Violence Chapter, I don't know what this plan is gonna look like. And I love that about the book. They're like setting up all these plans, setting up all these things that they, ho their hopes and dreams and wishes. There's little hints that they drop where it's like, somebody's gonna say like, I hope I don't die. Or like, ooh, I almost died. And I'm just like thinking, is this person gonna die? later on in the book we'll see but then there's also moments where they're setting up plans i'm just thinking like this plan is not gonna go off without a hitch and it's like what are the hitches that are gonna go off in this plan and what corner are you gonna write yourself into lee bardugo and how are you gonna write yourself out of it because after just reading violent chapter and what happened i'm just like mm. so how is this gonna play out because i want i want them to win i want them to get their money like what are they gonna do with their lives after this. And how much money are they gonna get? I hope they get a lot of Krug. I want them to get so much Krug, like all of the Krug you deserve. Like the Krug for the ice court job, the Krug for all the merchants, all the sugar, all the all the Jerda, all of the Krug, accumulate all of that and redistribute the wealth to the people in Barrow, to all the people that are in need that need this money, to other people in other countries that need the money, like redistribute the wealth. Get you a little piece to, to sell your life and take care of you and make sure you're fed for the rest of your days, but redistribute the wealth, okay? So hopefully that is a part of the ending, but yeah, I don't know. I've come to the realization that Novia Zem is basically North America and Africa. That's just an assumption. It's like North America in like frontier days, but also Africa. So we figured out where Africa is. I, I hope, I assume, I don't know. I might be wrong in the King of Scars duology. It might be different. We might go on a trip with Nikolai and find out, ooh, the country that's kind of like Africa is somewhere else. But beyond that, the action set pieces were really good. The silo, Inej and Dunyasha, like that piece of drama, that was a lot of mess. And then finding out about Nina's new powers, I was just like, we're doing a lot and I'm loving it. I'm loving all of this, all this drama, all this fierce action set pieces, Kaz in that fight with in, with the drags, in, in the, what is it, in the slat? Yeah. I'll give Lee her tens. 10, 10, 10. Across the board, Sis is writing action and it's like, you really get invested in it. And I'm looking forward to seeing what the action's gonna look like at the end. I'm really, really looking to see how this plan's gonna play out because, ooh, child, that plan is going, it's already awry. I don't know how, I don't know if we're gonna be able to salvage it, if it's gonna be in the last minute, or if most of the plan's gonna go down or what. Is Wylan lying? Ooh, I'm gonna see. <sighs> Are you as excited as I am? I am. Uh, I'm not gonna hold you. I finished Crooked Kingdom and it was a great ending. It was a fantastic ending. Wow. She had the girls going, 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 going off of her. On the girls. She stormed the category. Tens across the board for my good girly. She ate that. Hmm. The only thing is, the one relationship that I was really, really, really invested in, kind of laid off a little bit. It, coming close to the end of the book, they kind of chilled out. They was like in they little cocoon, they little love nest situation. And then like the ending, uh, kaput, like sad, like I can't, which is wild. Like how I care more about the heterosexual couple than I do about like the homosexual one. You know, how am I just, like, not caring? But it is what it is because, I mean, it's a, uh, a white woman, heterosexual white woman that, that wrote this. So it's like, mm -hmm. what more can I expect? And at least, you know, she didn't bury her gaze in the end. Like I said before, getting to know more of Jasper and Wyland's backstory and getting connected to them like that, it was great. But the kiss thing kind of threw me off and kind of pushed me back. And then, I don't know, I ain't gonna lie, I felt a little ways about Wylan and Jasper's 
white father having a discussion about him. I don't know. It was fine. It was nice. But I also kind of felt like... I don't know, but I felt a ways. Honestly, my biggest issue with Wylan and Jasper's father having that conversation in the bakery, I understood that it's like, you know, a father giving his son's partner like their blessing to be a get together kind of thing. I recently kind of realized why I found that scene weird because I'm watching like Love is Blind and Shane was asking like his mother if she approved of Natalie. And I was just like, why are you asking your mother if she approved? She just met her like five, 10, 15, 20 minutes it's a half hour ago maybe depending on how long they've been filming but at the same time it's like how can she approve like she don't really know Natalie so I, I don't know it was weird because I felt like as much as Calm got a lot of time to spend with Wyland and see their interaction that he could approve of it or give them their give them his blessing it was still weird for me. It, it was weird because I was just thinking about the racial dynamic relations going on. This is going to be a wild thing to say, but it felt like a slave master giving away his slave to this other white map. Nah, like this is, it's weird. It's, it feels weird. It just felt weird. Like I get the context where it's just like, you know, it's supposed to be a sweet, cute, cuddly moment of like, you know, the father and the son-in-law are like bonding, but it's just like, mm, I didn't like it. But that was just me. Maybe I didn't like it because of the, racial slavery implications that I felt like those dynamics look like that but it's just me it's not necessarily that's what it is you, nobody else has to see it that way I could just see it that way because of my own experiences but I just kind of also find it weird that like you know these parents have to be like all in your kids relationship business in this way that's like I have to approve I'm giving you my approval and then you as a child or like an adult or at least a close to adult young adult person is like who's been living on their own for so long and been so independent, a whole adult, that, like, how much do you need your father's approval? Like, you already took his money and did all kinds of wanky-janky stuff with it. It really doesn't matter whether his father approves or not. Like, girl, it was weird. I didn't like that. Another thing that was, like, an issue that I noticed while reading it, but I also kind of chalked it up to the context until Monty brought it, like really put it in my face and like really put it out there and said like, yo, there was yellow face in this book. There was yellow face in this book. And I was just like, when it was the whole reveal that Wyland was like, I, disguised, I guess we can say is the word, disguised as Koei, I was just like, mm, okay, that's, Okay, I get it. I get the context where it's like you're kind of tricking, but it's also like, mm, nah, mm -mm. I feel like we could have did something else though. I feel like in that whole scenario, we did not need to have Wyland be another, because I mean, yeah, like, I mean, Vanek still didn't take Kawhi. He still didn't take Wyland as Kawhi. Now, it's like, think about it, like, why was that a thing? Why did that happen? That didn't need to happen. It just didn't need to happen. And thus, it makes me go back and think about all of the things where I saw those racial implications as, like, could it have been also using that, too, for the, like, mistaken identity kiss? What's, what's, what? What? <laughs> I was just, uh, it's just a lot of like, all so bad. I felt that was weird and I really didn't think too much about it as I read it, but I just felt it was just an uneasy feeling like, oh. this whole, they both look alike in this place and you can't tell the difference, but you can kind of tell the difference when one talks and then it also happened for so long. It just shouldn't have happened, period. That was a failure. I will have to say that is a thing that was just like, that was not a 10 for the book. But for the most part, I give the book, girl, she gets her, she gets her, she gets her 10s though. I give her her, her overall 10 says, cause she handled business and other ways in most other ways that I appreciated. I love how the plan played itself out. It was big drama, big everything. The comedy brut brute, that being a theme throughout the story about like people like wearing masks and dressing up and pr playing pretend and putting on a whole bunch of drama. That is like the overall ending. I got some little clues, some little seeds planted at the end that are saying that there's going to be more, I believe from characters like Kaz and Inej within the Grisha verse. 
I do think Pekka Rollins, I'm assuming that he's probably going to get his own storyline down the line in other books that are coming out within the Grishaverse. I, I don't really care about hearing about Pekka Rollins. He's terrible. I had a blast and I'm looking forward to seeing what else is going to come out of the Grishaverse. I am kind of iffy about reading King of Scars and Rule of Wolves because of the mixed reviews, negative reviews that I've kind of heard about it. I probably will just kind of like borrow it. I don't think I want to own it. Like I just have no interest in owning it. I do love me some Nikolai. I did enjoy Nikolai in the Grisha trilogy, but not enough to be like, I gotta buy that book. Like, nah. I had fun reading the Six of Crows duology. I loved it so much. It was a good time. A bona fide classic. Lee, she stormed the category, honey. She ate the girls down. She came in, she did a little duck walk. Mm, mm, mm. Flipped her hair. Da, da, da. Pow, pow. Ta, 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 So shout out to Lee Bardugo for Six of Crows duology. She ate this. I had fun reading it. I will definitely reread it. Thank you for spending your time with me. And I'm out this bitch like fleek. Shout out to my girl Peaches. Thank you, girl.